I just want to shout out to um, the National Arts Centre English Theatre, which is the reason why uh, we've been able to have these investigations and these conversations uh, in collaboration with the Canada Council for the Arts, National Theatre School, HAL Round, and our presenting partners, Fulda. Um, deeply appreciative of um, that partnership um, and all the work that has gone into bringing people together to be able to speak, and particularly in this moment. Um, uh, I just want to say that we are on, I am on, specifically, I'm in Kingston on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, the Huron-Wendat, and the Haudenosaunee. Um, and uh, there are people, of course, meeting from so many different places across Turtle Island, both the north and the southern half, um, and, and, and situated on many traditional lands. So to maybe take a moment to consider the histories of the land that you're on, um, even though we're all meeting in this sphere. Um, above those lands. Um, uh, and then lastly, I'd just like to say that this panel, um, how artists respond. In the last panel, Jennifer talked about, Jennifer Atkinson talked about the requirement for, sci for scientists and artists to be able to have a, a meeting space because scientists are good at data and artists are good at interpreting. And so it gives me um, tremendous um, pleasure to think about uh, that this this conversation following um, Jennifer's words that um, just came before. I want to introduce to you the moderator, um, Kevin Matthew Wong. He's a theater creator, uh, projection designer. Um, he runs um, Broadleaf Theater, um, and he's also created uh, some fascinating work that relates specifically to climate change uh, in his own right. Um, and uh, I know that there's going to be a formal Q and A following this session. Please feel free to put your comments in the chat throughout and we'll try to keep an eye on them. Um, but I think that's all the business I need to say. Um, I work with the uh, Canada, uh, the National Arts Centre English Theatre and I'm the co-curator of this cycle with Chantal Bilodeau. And I think now it's over to you and I will disappear. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks so much, Sarah. Thanks for such a great uh, introduction to this panel. And thanks for curating us uh, to all be here together today. Uh, as Sarah mentioned, my name is Kevin Matthew Wong. Uh, I use he, him pronouns. Uh, I come to you today from Tikaranto, the territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat, the Anishinaabe, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Uh, I come to you as a Hakka Chinese theater creator, performer, and producer. In Toronto, I produce with Why Not Theatre. Uh, I lead a company called Broadleaf Theatre that Sarah mentioned that focuses on merging climate justice and performance. And I'm also a coordinator with the group Artists for Climate and Migrant Justice and Indigenous Sovereignty, uh, whose mandate I hope is pretty self-evident. Um, so today I am thrilled to moderate this panel, which features three incredible artists in conversation across four different time zones, two continents, all with a commitment to addressing climate crisis through their work. And these artists question their aesthetics and practices to better fight injustices. They have developed partnerships with non-arts organizations, science-based organizations. They engage with their community in new ways in order to demand systemic changes around climate. You'll find that their practices are incredibly varied. Uh, and as you'll find in our conversation, these are artists for whom climate and climate justice is interwoven into the DNA of their practices even if it's not explicitly stated in every project or any project. Uh, I'm also hoping that this conversation will delve into some of the ways that this specific moment, the COVID-19 crisis, the increased attention on anti-Black racism, and the need to dismantle white supremacy, how these are all deeply related to how we face our climate reality today. So the session's gonna be 45 minutes long. This breaks down into this quick uh, introduction, uh, followed by 30 minutes of conversation between myself and the uh, panelists. Then 10 minutes of Q&A uh, led by Chantal Bilodeau and uh, the questions that you ask in the Zoom chat box uh, will be collected by Chantal and will lead our final 10 minutes. So now without further ado, I'd love to give a quick introduction to our fantastic panel and you can also read their short bios in the chat box. So first, Anthony Simpson Pike is a theatre maker and dramaturg based in London, England. He is an associate artist at the Gate Theatre in Notting Hill and an associate director at the Yard Theatre in Hackney. Welcome, Anthony. Thanks for joining us so late. Thank you. Next up, Ken Schwartz. 
Uh, Ken is a Canadian theatre director, a playwright and arts activist. He is the artistic director of Two Planks and a Passion Theatre. He is the co-founder of the Ross Creek Centre for the Arts, both located in Kings County, Nova Scotia. Welcome, Ken. We'll find a way to hear you. <laughs> uh, we're working on it. And finally, uh, last but not least, Kendra Fanconi is the artistic director of The Only Animal, a company uniquely dedicated to theater that springs from a deep engagement with place and towards solutionary outcomes for this climate moment. She is based in Quexam in Seashell territory, which some might know as Roberts Creek on the Sunshine Coast of BC. Welcome, Kendra. So I'd like to start us off today uh, by getting to know everyone a bit better than what we can just know from your bios. So I'd like to get to know more about who and where we all are. So my first question is, how do your identities and personal lives intersect with the work that you create and the audiences and communities that you serve? And uh, for this question, maybe we'll start with Anthony. Yeah, great. Um, can you hear me all right? Perfect. Um, yeah, I think it's a really, it's a really good question. Um, and I, I, I really work from a political position because my existence is politicized. So the work I make is often speaking from a marginalized perspective, whether that's queer and or black or about something else. Um, and I think that, uh, that, that that's kind of one of the, the main anchor points. The other thing that I always come back to is um, this talk that Chimamanda and Goza Adichie gave called The Danger of a Single Story. Um, and she talks about how uh, the, the danger of a single story isn't necessarily that it's completely untrue, but it's that it becomes the only story that we know about a people or a community. And, for me, I think that stories build the world. In the last talk we heard from Jennifer, we heard that narrative is kind of the way that we come to understand each other and, and, and the things around us. Um, and the building blocks of that are stories. So I want to tell multiple stories um, for people who normally only get a stereotype. And I, and I want to engage in broadening narratives. Um, so yeah, I think it, it, in, in that sense, the work I make is sort of like necessarily uh, political uh, bec because because my identity is politicized on so many different in, at so many different intersections. Thanks, Anthony. And I wonder if I can ask a quick follow up, which is, can you give us a bit of context about uh, Notting Hill and Hackney specifically? And do you consider the um, the folks that live in Notting Hill and Hackney as the the core audience that you think about when you're creating work? Mm, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that's that that's definitely part of that's definitely part of my practice, and, and part of my practice is also asking the question of like who gets to be on stage and what mm. what um, what is considered as like uh, art and what's considered as like community work and why that binary exists. Where when I don't actually feel that it's it's useful or true, um, and so. So th that's that's a lot of the work that I've been doing at the gate, and and now I've just started at the yard. Um, that that's that's also a focus, but but I think that it is really true to say that um, one of the big shifts that needs to happen in UK theatre, at least, um, is breaking down this binary of. Uh, siloing work that is is based in the community or for the community from work that is for some other sort of abstract audience. Thanks Anthony. I definitely uh, think that we that resonates with us in Canada too, the idea of that separation. Um, thanks for that Anthony. Uh, maybe uh, Ken, uh, can we test your audio and then? <laughs> let's, let's try. Can, can you hear me? Yes, fantastic. Wow, so sorry. It's the uh, first time I've ever had an audio issue with a Zoom call. Of course, it would be this. That's all right. Do you need the question again, Ken? If you don't mind, we were a little bit engaged. Oh, great. 
so uh, oh, sorry. So I'll, I will restate the question. I um, So can we start with uh, how your identities and uh, how do you see your personal life intersect with the work that you create and the audiences and community that you serve? Well, thank you. Yeah. Um, so I uh, I live in rural uh, Mi'kma'ki in Nova Scotia, and um, I live in uh, the one of the agricultural breadbaskets of Canada, and uh, my rural life is uh, very um, connected to the work I create and the atmosphere and the conditions in which we create our work. Um, so uh, we, uh, the place where we create work is on a 187 acre farm and uh, food security has become central to everything we do at that art center. Um, and the lens through which we create work um, uh, uh, often, you know, uh, involves, well, actually always involves rural life. We may be talking about issues that affect uh, the entire world, uh, but it's always through that particular lens. Thanks, Ken. I, I wonder if you could tell us maybe just a little bit about uh, the specific audience that comes to your shows um, and what, what a rural audience looks like in your community. Sure. It's kind of interesting because there's, um, in the main, there are two uh, large groups that come to see our work. One would be our, what I would refer to as our local rural audience, um, who come from within, say, a 20-kilometer catchment area throughout farm country around us. But another large group of people would be people who uh, I would describe as urban dwellers, people who, who live in the Halifax Regional Municipality, for whom uh, a journey to come to our center is a journey into a very different way of life. Um, so in some ways, we're reflecting our rural existence to a, an increasingly non-rural population. Hmm. Uh, that's fascinating, Ken. I think that's also... Uh, a maybe a really good segue into uh, asking Kendra the same question, which is, uh, can you speak a bit about your identities, how they intersect with the work that you make and uh, the community that you serve? Yeah, um, well, first of all, I'm the daughter of an activist and a scientist. And so of course I rebelled against all of that and um, tried to make a life entirely in fiction in the theater. But now in middle age, I've really felt the coming home to both um, both of my parents' gifts to me. Um, I'm also the descendant from a long, long line of farmers going back uh, a long while. I'm an immigrant to Canada. Um, I was really looking for a homeland and spent about seven years wandering around trying to find a place um, to be and the landscape in BC really um, spoke to me. Uh, and I attribute that to why um, I ended up here. That's been 20 years ago now. Um, I'm, I'm completely charmed by Ken's description of his 187 acre farm. I, I live on a, a piece of land and I have um, a small farm here and I'm a forager. I'm, I'm also um, super concerned and obsessed with food security and the relationship with wild places. Um, I, I, I moved to, to this land um, specifically um, to have a more intimate relationship with the natural world. And when you do, you see climate change. So uh, I was saying that um, not this year, but the previous year, um, when it came time for spring, we didn't have puddles and we live in a rainforest. And we had this world without puddles because the water table was so low. And um, it, it was a strange recognition that I was missing puddles and that's kind of, um, yeah, so that, that relationship feeds um, our work, uh, which is um, primarily located um, on the land in, in different ways. It's so interesting to hear about you uh, being in that location and seeing the, the landscape change before your very eyes season after season. Um, and Kendra, I, I'm also curious about your audience. Is it similar to Ken in that you kind of have a mix of folks from the local community and also urbanites that are coming out to, to visit you? 
Um, I, I would say because we've made work in a whole bunch of different places, we almost always are dealing with an audience that has a connection to that place. It's a place that they love. And I'm reflecting on Jennifer's um, comments about grief and love being so um, intimately connected. I think that um, we've often said that our, our work is about um, creating a love story and making people fall in love with a place because what you love is what you will protect. Um, so I think about our audience um, uh, really not as any kind of homogenous group, except that they are organized care connected to the places and the ways um, that we make work. Mm. Thanks for that, Kendra. Okay. Um, I think that may be a good segue as well into the second question, which is um, how do considerations of climate get infused in each of your work? And uh, what role does the idea of justice play within that conception of climate? Um, and for the second question, we'll go in the, the reverse order. So we'll start with Kendra, then we'll go Ken and then Anthony. Uh, so Kendra. When we started our work 15 years ago, we started as a zero impact company, um, really concerned about you know, the, the theatrical tradition of driving the five ton truck to the dump after your strike. And we were determined not to be that. Um, as we began to work in um, increasingly more elemental situations, uh, we found ourselves making Nick's A Theater of Snow and Ice. And uh, when we premiered that piece at the Olympics, uh, it was in the warmest winter in 126 years, and our theater was literally melting. And that kind of brought us um, to the climate crisis um, and led to our work now, which is uh, all, all of our work, um, both the projects and the kind of underlying value structure is connected to the climate emergency. So we work um, for a 1.5 degree temperature rise that's in line with a livable planet. Uh, we do that work uh, in our values through carbon budgeting as a company. Uh, as a no-fly company, as a buy-nothing-new company, as deals with materials. There are other ways um, that climate justice and equity, diversity, and inclusion are linked to that, of course. Um, we deal with it thematically and what the work is about. Uh, we do projects around species lost, water insecurity, forest stewardship, climate justice, protection of wild places. Um, we almost always work with scientists and advocacy groups as a way of um, creating outcomes for our work that are solutionary. Our work really isn't um, didactic. The, the work relies on the kind of theatrical tools that make all theater work engaging. Um, but, but we are always kind of tied, tied back to a narrative that is about um, this climate moment. Um, at, we're just coming into a three-year relationship as the theater company in residence at the David Suzuki Foundation. That work is about forming an artist brigade, hopefully with many of you who are on this call um, and other people in our community. Uh, the work of the artist brigade is to bring arts and artists to the front line of the climate movement. And I would, I would really uh, echo what Jennifer said about um, the other people who are telling the climate narrative, be it scientists, um, academics, environmental organizations, journalists, are keen, are, are chomping at the bit to work with artists, the communicators who can connect them to the people because they see that fact-based approach is dead. Mm -hmm. So um, that's a uh, a big overriding work that will happen through commissioning of many pieces over the next three years. That's very exciting, Kendra. And is that specifically theater uh, performance or, or the brigade is interdisciplinary? It is an interdisciplinary brigade. Yeah, we're working with partners uh, at BC's Alliance for Arts and Culture to help um, us reach out into the community and to the people who have stories that need to be told. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing more about your work, Kendra. It's awesome to hear how many different angles that your company is coming to, to the climate crisis with uh, and how many different players are involved in that. So thank you for sharing. Uh, moving back to Ken then, um, the question is, uh, how do considerations of climate get infused into your work, Ken? And what does the uh, role of justice play? Yeah, um, I, the center where we work is a place we've been since 2000 and in the 20 years 
uh, that we've been there, we can see uh, the effect of climate change um, in the weather patterns, in our ability um, to grow food for the center, um, and in our ability to perform outdoors because our, our theater company performs exclusively outdoors. And um, we try to tread as lightly on the land as possible. So we um, take inspiration from the land and let the land sort of design our productions as opposed to the other way around. Um, but because of uh, the, the fact that we are so connected to the land, um, we've had no choice but to respond and to become, in a sense, a uh, activists with regards to climate change. Um, everything from uh, the way we educate young people at the center about the food they eat um, and how uh, what food waste means in relation to climate change, uh, the transportation of food, um, and then all the way to the kind of impact that our productions themselves have on the environment. Um, and to be honest, when we started, these were artistic choices we made. It wasn't until we became connected to the land that we started to, to understand our roles as artists and citizens um, with regards to activism around climate change. We didn't choose to perform outdoors for those reasons, but we came to understand how important those things were um, from our work. Thanks for that, Ken. Can you speak a bit more than to the artistic decision that got you to the performing outdoors? Sure. Um, really, it was about stripping away almost every level of artifice that we could. Uh, every filter uh, between an audience member and an actor. Um, and to, to have as direct an interaction, you know, uh, between audience and performer in natural light, um, on the same ground, um, in the, within the same um, atmosphere. Um, and that was, that really drove the decision. Um, also a, a, a fundamental desire to create work in collaboration with nature, if that makes sense. Um, and so that was really what drove those initial decisions. And through being more connected to agriculture and to our natural environment, speaking for myself, I started to have a different understanding of my place in the world. Mm. That's so awesome to hear, Ken. Thanks for sharing a bit more about the artistic process that got you to where you are today. Um, I think just reflecting now on the interesting interplay between the playing with reality and Kendra, you mentioning like using the, the all the tools of theatricality and fantasy and the fantastical and, and how those are an interesting interplay when we think about work that is about the climate, that there has to be some element of let's reflect upon what's actually happening here on the ground. Um, so now moving on to Anthony with the same question. Um, how are considerations of climate infused in your work, Anthony, and what does the role of justice play in that work? Yeah, great. Um, I think firstly, it's really important for me to acknowledge that I really see myself um, at the sort of beginning of my journey um, in, in, in making work generally, but also um, in the context of the climate crisis. Um, and so I'm really, I'm really inspired uh, hearing from uh, Kendra and Ken. Um, but there are a number of things that that come into play when I'm thinking about the work I, I want to make. Um, one of them I, I sort of mentioned earlier is this thing about broadening broadening narratives and, and multiple stories. Um, I was talking to a playwright called Abhishek Majumdar, and I don't I don't know um, if this is actually his quote, but he was talking about. Um, uh, dystopian fiction, and he was saying that um, uh, he, th th they'd read uh, someone had read loads of dystopian fiction, um, and they were trying to find uh, examples of post-capitalist literature 
And it was far easier to find literature about the end of the world than it was to find literature about the end of capitalism. So we're stuck in this like singular story about the way that we are able to live. And I think it's, I think that's one of the things that we as storytellers and uh, people engaged in imagination can do well. Um, the other thing that I've been thinking about a lot recently, um, especially as it concerns sort of the UK context is the idea of um, structure and form rather than just content. I think as, as makers in the UK, at least when we're talking about uh, work around this subject, we're really focused on content. We're really focused on telling people that climate change exists and you know you need to use less straws or something like that. Um, and we're much less focused on what the structures are that um, allow us to make work. Uh, and what the form is that might best like activate people. And, and I think that if we thought more about the structure, we might do a bit less kind of like uh, s telling people that climate change exists and a bit more punching yeah. up um, and, and, and thinking about like, what are the tools we have as organizations, as, uh, as activists, as, as makers that can, that, that can mean that we can make structures that, that, that uh, that force our energies upwards into making change happen on that level, as well as talking to, to, to individuals. But I think it's really dangerous when we get stuck in trying to convince individuals where, when we know that like a hundred companies are um, uh, responsible for the majority of, of emissions. Um, so, so, uh, so an example of, of that as well, um, in terms of my own work is, is thinking about the interventions that, that I can make. So rather than just making shows, I've also been thinking about uh, what sort of like more long-term experiences I can be engaged with. So uh, in, in last year and in the year before, we ran an artist climate lab where we got, where we got a group of artists um, and I, I dramaturged the first one, kind of thinking about what the story of change might be. Um, like, how can we also think about drum surgery in that context, as well as in in a sort of like playmaking context? Um, and um, just to move quickly on to my the last point I wanted to make is about about thinking about the tools that we already have. So I think like as this makers, we're really good at imagination and we're really good at like rehearsing for things. Um, so what if we prepared for the future now? Like, what if we what if we rehearsed for the future, um, and and rehearsed for um, a way that we would like to interact as a community together? That's one of the things that I was making at the Royal Court just before this happened, and then it had to be cancelled uh, because. Uh, because I was, I, I'd, I'd made a show about imagine that you're in not a show, an experience about imagine that you're in a crisis, and then it was a, a group of a group of, um, of citizens were invited to spend twelve hours together as a twelve-hour rehearsal, rehearsing for what what kind of community they wanted to be in the future, and then the coronavirus said no, so um, <laughs> that's postponed for the future. <laughs> Oh, um, just on the on the subject of justice, like climate, as we heard from Jennifer, climate justice is racial justice, it's social justice, uh, it, it, it's everything. And so for me, like, uh, it's really important that we join up the dots. Thanks, Anthony. Those were great points. Uh, yeah, that really resonates with me that we lack the imagination to imagine a future without capitalism. Um, it's, it's interesting that you have a friend that was actually searching for those stories and trying to quantify. Um, thanks for that. Um, I think maybe now is a good time for us to start connecting some of the dots and, and having uh, some more open conversation. And I'd just like to pose a question that maybe we can all discuss, um, which is, what are some of the challenges that you faced in creating your work that is this infused with these um, ideas of climate justice and other forms of justice. Um, and the flip side of that is what opportunities do you see? Uh, and maybe that can also spring from this particular moment of, of COVID-19. Um, so I'm curious about any of your thoughts on that. I 
second goals if he wants. Sure. Thanks, Ken. Um, but what resonates for me most in this moment when we're talking about recovery is asking the question, what's worth recovery? Um, and that's a terrifying thing, I think, for a lot of people to consider, but it's also, I think, the greatest opportunity that we have. You know, what is worth recovering? Um, and we have, like, this opportunity to think about what's worth recovering. Um, that's a, I know that I realize that's a very big idea, but that's what I've been thinking a lot about. Uh, you know, what is it about what I've done before that speaks to the aspirations we have of the world when we try to pick up the pieces. Um, and there are some things that I do think are worth recovering, but there's so many other things that I feel like we can leave behind. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Can you give us an example of each of those things, something that you hope to recover and something that you hope to leave behind? Yeah, well... In terms of things to leave behind, I think uh, uh, the thinking that the only things that can save us as a society are the structures and systems that we already have. You know, the, the notion that if without the structures and systems that we have in place now, the only other option is anarchy and chaos, <laughs> as opposed to what I think is the reality, which is that that many of these systems um, have never really served us. We've you've been serving them. Um, so um, it's hard for me to be specific right now, um, but it is something that I've been thinking a lot about. Hmm. Um, and then is there is there something to recover? That's something to do away with. And maybe there's yeah, not. something to recover. Um, you know, aspects of my life that I really want to recover are the ones about direct human interaction. Um, every opportunity we have to be together and to really listen to each other in an unmediated way, um, especially meeting and speaking with people and really listening to people that we've never met before. I've been thinking a lot about that, about people in my own community that I... I live next to, but I don't actually live with them. Um, I've been saying, I've been thinking about what uh, our art center might, how how they can be uh, a catalyst for for bringing those people together. Mm. Thanks for that, Ken. I think that idea of living next to each other but not living with each other is something that uh, we can all reflect upon. Um, Kendra, Anthony, do you have any thoughts on this um, question, which is what are some of the challenges that you're facing in, in your work and what are some of the opportunities that you're seeing? Yeah, um, definitely. I, I think, uh, as I mentioned before, I, I think um, one of the challenges is an over-reliance on content about the climate crisis um, from programmers. Um, and so that can be something that you're like pushing up against as well. But but also drawing from the the talk that we just listened to, um, there's also something around like facing grief, um, which is which is which is something that we don't talk about enough as well. Like I think um, I think I certainly have. Uh, I certainly have a sense that I want to make people feel hopeful, but but listening to what Jennifer was saying around the difference between grief and hope as well, um, you know, hope uh, may be something that uh, that allows you to to sort of not take action because um, because you're just kind of like it's almost like a, a religious experience or something. Um, and how can we how can we embrace grief and, and and act in a way that might make future generations be able to hope? Um, that's something that that feels like a tricky thing as well. Like uh, especially in a context of you know a capitalist theatre uh, production context where um, the focus is really on 
entertainment a, a, a lot of the time. Um, how how is it possible, and how do you make space to make work about about grief or work that that's about facing up to um, facing up to something that that a lot of people, including myself, um, find find really hard to 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 truly kind of embed and, and consider. Um, uh, yeah, and I, I think the, the the other challenge I have is that I, re I really, I think it's not useful to think in, in binaries. So I really understand the purpose of uh, activating individuals. Um, but I also am trying to do a lot of work around thinking about uh, organisational organizational power, power, powers of like theater communities to come together and, and speak upwards and how, how, how that works. I, I don't know that I've got come to an answer around that, but that is my challenge at the moment. Thanks, Anthony. Thanks for articulating so many ideas that uh, I, I think we're all hovering around but haven't put into words yet. You know, the the, the need to face that grief and the kind of false balm that that hope can be too um yeah and and that that is in all all our conversations about justice every single one there are kind of those traps too so thank you for that um kendra uh i wonder if you want to answer this question and then we'll go to a quick quick q a uh, and the question again was uh opportunities and challenges um kind of picking up where anthony left off um i think we know where we are with the climate crisis right now, the UN has called this the decade of action. Um, taking action now is what guarantees a livable or, or gives us the best chance for a livable future. Um, uh, I, I think that the call then is for systemic change. It's not just about washing out our plastic bags. And it's very easy for us having grown up in this neoliberal framework many of us, most of us, to feel like it, individual action is all we have and, and is enough and is right. Um, along, uh, so how do you create systemic change? Well, there, I mean, that's like a, a huge day long thing that we can, we can do later. But I think that as artists who work in collective experience, we are well suited to come in as collaborators in creating that systemic change. That we, what we know about um, climate grief and climate anxiety that is unaddressed is that it freezes people up. They cannot mobilize and we need um, to mobilize. So that our work as artists, that work of the heart, uh, of that hot fire that can, can melt and mobilize, that can take people on a journey that is emotional, th that is not just like the news story you read about like the death of, of animals or the wildfires in Australia that just completely doesn't, doesn't often lead you to action. So again, this is sort of talking about the role of the artist, the opportunities for the artist. I also think that climate literacy is a piece of it. It's something we're trying to do with the Artist Brigade too, because to know what the problems are and what the solutions are, we're being told the solutions are there. It's not a problem of we don't have the solutions. The problem is the mobilizing of the solutions and the systemic change. And then, uh, Finally, I think to, to talk again to this notion that's been brought up about the importance of the vision, I'm definitely being told that by our advocacy partners that part of what, what we need is to um, the artist to contribute to is the building of the vision of what's on the other side. They call it beach mentality. So if you're out in BC and you're trying to get out to one of the Gulf Islands and you have to sit through two, two sailing weight on the ferries and um, it's really hot and your air conditioning is broken and there's sand in your sandwiches. You don't give up going to the beach because of those things. The beach, the vision of the beach pulls you through all of those things. You, you don't want to turn back. You want to go forward. And so we're being really called our sector at this time to come forward with our imaginations of, of what that culture of stewardship or culture of care um, what it is, what it looks like, why we want to go there, what the humanity um, is that replaces that those the capitalist structures that we have. Thanks, Kendra. Thanks for giving us that vision of the beach there. Um, and you know what I'm reflecting upon now, and uh, I don't think we actually have time for a Q and A. Um, oh, we we can have one question actually. Oh wow. Okay, so we're gonna have one question, and then maybe I'll do a final. Just what I'm thinking about, and maybe. Um, uh, just one 
word or sentence from each of you as to where you are. I know it's kind of an impossible question, but um, okay. So I think we have one question uh, and Chantal might be joining us for that one question. And here's Chantal. Hi, uh, oh, can you? Uh, yeah, you thank you. I just needed to be unmuted. Um, I'm Chantal Bilodeau, for those of you who don't know me, um, co-curator with Sarah. I think uh, one question, let's go for a question by a young artist who is asking um, what uh, suggestion or advice do you have for someone who wants to, who would like to start a theater company that is environmentally responsible and politically involved to fight climate change? Oh, that's a big one. Three minutes, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Anthony? I'm, I'm going to pass that on to Kendra and Ken because I think they're best placed. Um, I think that the, cli the climate um, issue is enormous and enormously multifaceted and that there's room for everyone and your particular view, the work you feel attached to in the work you want to do. If we're going to lift something big, we all have to find our place to grab on. And mm -hmm. so to go as deeply as you can into your obsessions and your um, what you are, are drawn to and know that that is your piece. You don't have to search any further for what your piece is, mm -hmm. maybe beyond a basic climate literacy, which I probably think you have, to know what your work is to do and to follow it as far as you can. Thanks, Kendra. Can any quick thoughts maybe like? <laughs> sure. Uh, don't be limited by the architecture of the institutions that already exist. Don't let um, the institutionalization of our art form and the way that things have been done before um, become the restriction on your vision for your art because it's not a productive restriction. Hmm. Thanks, Ken. I really appreciate that um, challenge to, to infuse the creativity that we need for the climate crisis into challenging the institutions that constrain what we think uh, we can or can't do as artists. Um, I'll maybe just uh, touch on two points really quickly, and then we'll end off with a sentence or a thought from each of you. And then we're at time, amazingly. Um, so I just wanted to reflect upon and thank everybody for reflecting upon the power of story as really integral to what we do, the power of convening conversations, difficult conversations, and the need for folks to kind of, what I've been thinking about as I've been listening to all of you speak is to place ourselves in the role of protagonist in stories. This is, our, this is everybody's moment to act and it's everybody's opportunity to really investigate who they are, where they're coming from. And it, it, in our way, it's our duty to do that before we can get to the, the, the next step, which is the systems change, uh, you know. So that's what I'm reflecting upon. Thank you all for those thoughts. And maybe we'll just go in the order now. We'll start with Ken, then we'll go Anthony, and then we'll end off with Kendra, and we'll call it a panel. Uh, what was the question? Sorry, Kevin. Uh, one word or sentence that is on your mind right now, thought. Oh. Uh, my sentence would be, I'm feeling the challenge. <laughs> Thanks so much, Ken. And Anthony, a uh, word or a thought? Oh. You're muted, Anth Anthony. Uh, can you see? Uh, oh. I think he's frozen out of the conversation. Oh, no. Uh, Anthony, if you want to type it, we can read it out too. Um, Kendra, do you want to do yours and then we'll go back? Oh, here's Anthony, actually. Maybe. <laughs> Anthony, a, a sentence or a thought, word? Um, yeah. Oh. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> my sentence is, I, I wish I had better internet. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's um, uh, the word I think, um, I think, uh, I think my word is flux. Thanks, Anthony. I can hear that. Um, I, I would just invite people into action uh, right now with everything you've got. 
Um, no idea is um, perfect, but no idea uh, will ever go anywhere without a beginning. So to please begin um, and to um, reach out and build network within this community here. There are many, there's a huge community of artists and many opportunities that exist within it. And this COVID pause is a time um, where to, to, um, we can make those connections in order to, to, um, to tell this story in collaboration with the other people telling the climate story. Awesome. Thank you all so much. Huge thanks to Anthony Simpson Pike, to Ken Schwartz, to Kendra Fanconi. Huge virtual applause uh, to all of you. Thanks so much for being such uh, inspiring artists and doing the work in your own communities. Uh, back to Chantal. Hello, uh, thank you very much. These sessions go so fast. I could have listened to you um, much, much uh, longer, but unfortunately we have to uh, move to the next one. So thank you, Kevin. Uh, thank you, Kendra, Anthony and Ken. Um, thank you everyone who was on this call and everyone who is watching from the live stream. We are now moving to our next session in just a few minutes at um, five o'clock Eastern time, which is a panel titled Leadership and Structure for Change with Sarah Garten Stanley and Ravi Jain. And um, I hope to see you there. Thank you. Thank you.